So it is with great pleasure that I get to introduce our speaker for today. Belle Bruce is an Australian registered nurse midwife who has recently submitted her PhD thesis to the University of Sydney in Australia. Belle has qualifications in midwifery, nursing and paramedicine and has over 15 years clinical experience in a variety of hospital and community settings. Belle's research that she's going to explore today with us explores the administration of intravenous fluids to women in labour. So over to you, Belle. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Um, I do have a storm sort of on my sort of round, so I will be turning off the camera, um, but I'll turn it back on at the end. But thank you um, for joining me this afternoon or this morning. Um, so as Ali said, I'm Belle Bruce. I'm from Sydney, Australia, and I'm here today to, um, presenting my research so that looks at IV fluids in labour. I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors, uh, Professor Julie Lisk, Dr. Heather Shepherd, and Associate Professor Brad DeVeers. Next slide, please, Ali. Um, before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the people of the Aurora Nation, um, of which the University of Sydney campuses stand, and pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I probably also begin, I have a tendency to speak very quickly. Um, I do have a plan for Ali to sort of signal to me if it starts getting out of control because Zoom is sort of blackness. Um, if you have any concerns with how fast I'm getting, could you please just make a comment in the chat for Ali to signal me? Thank you. Okay, so before I get into the details of my actual research, I like to start with this slide. And the reason for that is because I like to acknowledge that my research has evolved from my experiences on the clinical floor working with women. My background is a little bit different um, to many in that I started my healthcare career undertaking a paramedic degree before primarily working as an emergency nurse before moving into midwifery. This background has shaped my perspective around IV fluids. When I moved from nursing into midwifery, I quickly became confused about how and why IV fluids were being used. They were being used a lot in large amounts with not much monitoring for reasons that didn't quite make sense. The CTG trace that you see in the picture was one of the many that started my PhD journey. The woman and the baby it belonged to received almost six litres of fluids, so little repetitive dips in the fetal heart rate. It didn't make sense, and I thought to myself, someone should look into it, so I did. Next slide, please. Today, I'm presenting the third and final study of my PhD, a retrospective cohort study of maternal and neonatal outcomes. The two earlier studies of my PhD were a retrospective clinical chart review um, and fluid balance documentation audit. And I also did qualitative semi-structured interviews with midwives across Australia. I have had the opportunity to present the preliminary findings from these two studies earlier back in VIDM in 2021. So it's great to be back to present this final study. Next slide, please. To give you a little background about IV fluids use, IV fluids are currently used in labour and childbirth for a variety of reasons, and that includes administration of oxytocin for induction augmentation of labour as a preload for regional anaesthesia, anaesthesia so before epidural or spinals, um, to manage signs of fetal compromise like fetal tachycardia or fetal bradycardia, um, maternal hydration, particularly in cases if the woman is persistently vomiting or if they're nearby mouth, and for IV fluid resuscitation, so if you're thinking more eboluses for maternal hypertension and postpartum hemorrhage. However, there is widespread clinical practice variation in how IV fluids are being used both in Australia and across the world, and this includes variations for why and how they are used, um, including IV fluid type, volume, and rate of administration. Um, but what is clinical practice vari variation and does it matter? Next slide, please. So clinical practice variation as a definition is a difference in healthcare processes or outcomes compared to peers or to a standard such as an evidence-based um, guideline recommendation. A degree of variation is expected um, and it rep represents that care is being sort of flexible or adjusted to what people need and their choices. And this is known as warranted variation. But on the flip side, we also have a warranted variation and that can signal a practice that is not underpinned by robust evidence can contribute to an increased risk of harm and can contribute to an additional cost burden for the healthcare system. Next slide, please. 
My research has shown that there is some warning signs for unwarranted variation when it comes to IV fluids in labour, and this includes uncertainty about current practice, questions about current practice, concerns about current practice, and we also have a recognised gap in evidence. Next slide. This um, sort of unwarranted, this variation sort of concern is sort of captured in this quote, which is from my interviews I did as a second study. This was by a senior nurse midwife who said, I think it, IV fluids, is one of the most poorly managed aspects of intrapartum care. And I've always thought that. And I've always, in previous roles, wanted to find good evidence and there isn't any. And it's been really curious to me how, when I go from facility to facility, everyone has different practices and no one really understands why they do it. However, it is difficult to determine whether it is actually unwarranted variation that we are seeing because we don't actually have clear standards of practice and further research is needed. Next slide, please. So one of the aspects of research that is needed is that we do need to understand more whether IV fluids can actually impact the labour and birth process and maternal and neonatal outcomes. And this formed the basis of the aim of my study to investigate where there is a relationship between the administration of IV fluids to women and labour and maternal and neonatal outcomes. Next slide, please. Now, to give you a quick peek of some of the behind the scenes of my research, um, one of the things I considered was whether IV fluids actually could contribute to myometrial contractility. This is the best way I've been able to work out how to illustrate it. Um, I'd just like to point out that it is my own ponderings. It's developed from clinical practice, reading different literature, and it's not, it's not scientific fact. Um, but one of the reasons I'd like to point it out is like if there's anyone out there that can help me with this, please give me a call or an email. Um, next slide, please. So from this pondering about whether IV fluids could contribute to myometrial contractility and for different clinical experiences I actually had as a midwife, I came up with this research question, could IV fluids and labour contribute to primary postpartum hemorrhage? Next slide, please. So primary postpartum hemorrhage, as many of you are aware, PPH is one of the most common complications of childbirth. The World Health Organization defines primary PPH as maternal blood loss or greater or equal to 500 within the first 24 hours of giving birth. Um, 500 mils, yes. Um, the most common cause of primary PPH is uterine artery, um, and we have been seeking an increased incidence of primary atonic PPH in high-income countries such as Australia, UK and the United States. However, this increase isn't fully explained with known changes in risk factors or reporting. Um, it is biologically plausible a relationship between volume of IV fluids and primary PPH exists, which is one of these, another one of my smaller drawings for you, um, but it's not something that I've been able to um, find that anyone else has examined. Next slide, please. With this in mind, my primary objective was to evaluate whether administration of high volume IV fluids in labour, so greater or equal to 2,500 um, 2, mils, increases the risk of primary postpartum hemorrhage and other adverse outcomes for women with a term gestation single term pregnancy in comparison to low volume IV fluids in labour. Next slide, please. So some of the things I looked at in terms of maternal outcomes included the primary postpartum hemorrhage, emergency zero section and major perineal trauma. Additionally, I looked at some neonatal outcomes and this included neonatal weight loss greater or equal to 10% of birth weight in the first 48 to 96 hours of age. And I included this specifically because there's a bit of research coming out, um, for example, from Canada and that, um, showing that IV fluids could actually be contributing to increased um, neonatal weight loss. And the reason for why that's a concern is it could be um, leading to unnecessary use of, and avoidable use of formula. So I could probably speak to 30 minutes alone um, about this, and I'm sure there's people out there that are interested, but I'm just going to quickly touch on it in today's um, presentation. Well, the other neonatal outcomes I'm going to include today is the umbilical artery called blood acidosis, so a pH less than 7.1 and or base excess, less than or equal to minus 12. Thanks, Ali. So just a quick about study design and methods. It was at one perinatal um, tertiary referral possible in Sydney, Australia. It's a retrospective cohort study. I did initially design it as a prospective study, but there was ethical consent issues that um, the ethics committee requested that it wasn't feasible. So I had to redesign it as retrospective. Um, and the inclusion criteria was admitted for labour and birth care between 37 to 42 weeks gestation, so term, um, with a live singleton fetus in the head down position and planning a vaginal birth. Next, click Ali. 
um, study factor, exposure to IV fluids, um, and that was we had to categorize into two um, groups, low fluids and high fluids. And the reason we did that was really insufficient um, or inadequate sort of documentation around IV fluids. It meant that we actually had to categorize into low and high groups. Um, total IV fluids volume was calculated from the point of first administration during labor to the time of birth, and it included oxytocin infusion for induction or augmentation of labor. Next slide. Um, for anyone who's interested, the, a little bit about the statistical analysis, we did descriptive statistics, which are on the next couple of slides, um, and essentially did multivariable logistic regression with multiple imputation um, for missing data. Next slide, please. So who was in my study? So this is at a hospital that has approximately 4,500 births a year. 2,542 women were um, met my inclusion criteria during the study period, and I was able to review 1,403 cases. I had to exclude 380 cases um, for insufficient IV fluids documentation, and so overall 1,023 cases um, were included, which met the sample size calculation that we're hoping for, which was 1,009. Um, in the low IV fluids group, there was 810 um, cases and in the high IV fluids groups, there was 213. Thank you, Ali. So to give you a bit of an idea of who was in the study, um, both of the groups were a similar age with the 33 years. They were mainly born in Australia, more likely to be having their first baby. Um, and not unexpectedly, the high IV fluids group were more likely to be um, more likely to have an induction of labour than the, the low IV fluids group. Next slide. The low IV fluids group also had a higher percentage of spontaneous vaginal birth, and the most common duration of active labour in both groups was 6 to 12 hours. Next slide, please. Um, pretty even split there with between the um, whether they're male or female babies, um, and the most common birth weight was the 3 to 4 kilo group. Okay, so maternal outcomes. Next slide, please. So I'll start off with the primary outcome of PPH. A total of 339 women in the cohort had a primary PPH. So this was 33.1%. This is a little bit higher than the current reported levels in Australia, which is about 21%. Um, but it is important to note that the 21% may actually be sort of an, um, not quite exact due to differences in PPH definitions and reporting. Um, overall, initially there was a positive association between high volume of IV fluids and primary PPH, but that was in the univariable regression. When we adjusted for confounding factors such as maternal age, BMI, country of origin, priority, um, mode, of, um, mode of birth, duration of active labour and birth type, um, the odds ratio decreased and statistical significance was lost. So there wasn't an association in this cohort for primary PPH. Next slide, please. Um, to give you an idea of the blood loss overall, maternal estimated blood loss ranged from 40 mils to 3,400 mils, um, with the medium for the cohort being 350, which was also the medium for the low volume of IV fluids group. The high volume IV fluids group did have a slightly higher blood loss at 400 mils, um, and most of the sample did actually receive, also receive 40 units of oxytocin infusion um, for PPH prostolactics or PPH management. Next slide, please. So moving on to some of the secondary outcomes for maternal results, overall 278 women had an emergency zero section, which was 27.2% for the cohort, um, and that was 176 for the low volume group, um, so 21.7%, and 102 um, women in the, or 47.9% in the high volume IV fluids group had an emergency cesarean section. Um, what we actually found was a positive association between high volume IV fluids and emergency cesarean section, um, which you can see here in the table. We adjusted the very factors such as priority, age, um, model of care. Um, the IV antibiotics in labor sort of re don't relate to GP GBS prophylaxis, it relates to IV, antics, IV antibiotics for infection or suspected infection. And we did actually have the statistical significant um, odds ratio of 1.99, um, the confidence 95% confidence of 1.4 to 2.8. Um, for the high volumes IV fluids group, suggesting that women in the high volume IV fluid group were more likely to have cesarean section for um, emergency cesarean section than the low volume group. Next slide, please. 
the other secondary outcome I'd sort of like to go into is the major perineal injury, and that's greater than degree, um, third degree perineal injury, so third and greater. So a total of 27 women out of 745 who had a vagina birth, which is 3.6%, which is sort of on par for this facility, sustained a major perineal injury. Due to the low number of events, I did adjust the logistic regression model a little bit. So we had um, IV fluids group, parity, country of origin, and use of forceps and in our birth rate as the um, adjusting factors. Um, however, um, in the univariable regression, volume of IV fluids was associated, but similar to PPH, the adjusted odd ratio was not significant. Thanks, Ali. So babies. Next slide, Ali. So... Neonatal weight loss, greater than 10% of birth weight in the first 48 to 96 hours. Um, just to quickly touch on the greater than 10%, that's the cutoff that we use for um, excessive weight loss, which is probably similar to other places um, of people um, online. Overall, 96 out of the 947 neonates had available weight data for, they lost um, greater than 10% weight loss um, in the first 48 to 96 hours of age. So that was um, 63 or 8.4% in the low volume IV fluids group and 33 at 199 or 16.6% .6 in the high volume IV fluids group. Um, in sort of supporting of the other research that is starting to show um, about IV fluids and excessive neonatal weight loss in this first sort of postpartum period, we also we did find a statistically significant adjusted odd ratio of 1.7, suggesting the babies in the high group were more likely to have an excessive weight loss than the low IV fluids group. Um, the other factor highlighted there in red is first time mums were also more likely to have a baby with um, excessive weight loss greater than 10% in the first 48 to 96 hours of age. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing I had a positive association for was the umbilical artery called blood acidosis. So um, we also had, we had a bit extra more missing data here. So we miss, um, data was missing for 156 of the 947 neonates um, in the neonatal analysis. Um, but 121 of the 947 neonates that, um, of the cohort, or 12.8%, did have an umbilical artery called blood failures indicating acidosis at birth. And this was statistically significant in the odds, um, the adjusted odds ratio with an odds ratio of 1.8. So again, suggestive that we're more likely to have cord blood acidosis. Um, admittedly, there could be different reasons for this finding, such as fetal distress that we couldn't really capture in this study. But we do know from other areas of research that and health that acidosis is a recognised risk factor of infusing large amounts of crystalloid solutions. So it's one of the many things that we should be looking into further when it comes to IV fluids and labour and maternal and in outcomes, particularly when you consider acidosis could actually be one of the things that affects myometrial contractility. Next slide, please. So strengths and limitations of the study. So one of the strengths was that it was a large sample size of over a thousand cases, and it met our um, for the maternal outcome. It met our um, met our de novo sample size um, of a thousand and nine, and we also used multi imputation and logistic regression to adjust for many of the confounders. However, there was quite a few sort of limitations that we should um, that need to be bear in mind. One of them was that we had to use documentation um, of visual estimated. Um, maternal uh, like maternal blood loss. So this isn't always as exact as um, using measured blood loss. And the main limitation of this study was inadequate, inadequate documentation of IV fluids and an extension maternal fluid balance. So this contributed to things have, having to split our people into two groups and also it could have increased the risk of type 2 error um, as a result from diluting um, as well. So considerations for the future... Um, I know it's sort of a bit of a fast roundup of this research, and I'm sure you probably have some questions. But as I mentioned at the start, there is a large evidence gap that exists um, regarding the administration of IV fluids during labour. And inadequate documentation is a major barrier for this. Um, I'd like to point out it's not my re it's not just my research, but it's not something that other researchers that have across the world have found when they've been trying to look at IV fluids. Why this is an issue is it's really hard to work out what is going on for something when something isn't documented or, when, or you can't measure it. So it's something that we have to address. And the way that we can close out our knowledge gap and our evidence gap, gap is that we need to do some things better. Um, we, do, we do need re um, more research and we need research into maternal and inner outcomes. Um, and yes, random, randomised controlled trials are going to be needed, but we also probably need more than just RCTs. And one of the reasons for that is that 
um, it's really important to understand what current practice is to make sure that we include the right sort of interventions in our RCTs, um, things like making sure that we include um, the rates or the variable rates that we give things, boluses if they occur, as opposed to steady rates. So it's more the outcomes of the RCTs are more reflective of what we do in clinical practice now so that we can gain knowledge. Okay. Um, when I pondered how we can sort of bring about this pay, um, uh, this change, uh, I've I sort of ended up in the world of implementation science. So this picture here is the behavior change wheel. Um, and using basically using these methods like behavior change wheels provide us with like systematic ways um, that we can disrupt the status quo. At the moment, the status quo for IV fluids and labor, what's not really seen as important. And this affects how we teach, administer, monitor, and document. So using implementation strat strategies could be the way that we can disrupt the status quo and move forward into the future where we know a bit more about how to manage it. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, the main finding of this cohort study was that there was no association between high volume IV fluids and primary PPH after adjusting for demographic and clinical factors. But due to the limitations such as the IV fluids documentation limitations, this question is far from being answered. An unexpected finding was the positive association between the high volume IV fluids group and the being more likely to have an emergency serum section. Um, and so this is something that is interesting, um, which I'm sure you all agree with, and it's something that we should probably have a look at in more detail to see potentially the reasons why that could, uh, could have occurred, whether it's just a one-off on this study um, or whether there's other reasons for it that we haven't addressed yet in research. Um, the neonatal outcomes included a positive association between high volume IV fluids group and neonatal weight loss of greater than 10% in the first 48 to 96 hours of age. I know Liz um, from the earlier episode um, earlier was sort of sitting on here, so she probably provide, provide a bit more information about why having this um, excessive weight loss and um, is it could be like an important finding and something that we can sort of move towards um, to help with breastfeeding support. Um, and But my main sort of finding that comes out of my research is that we need to sort of document our, our sort of IV fluid administration and maternal fluid balance better because at the moment we're in a situation where we can't work out what is happening because we are not documenting. So whilst I would love to come to you with eight, after eight years of studying this topic with a bit more answers, that's the main one I can come up with for now. Thank you.